Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. We are welcoming a new month with another jam-packed show. Beginning the broadcast, Nebraska's corn conditions are down slightly this week. The latest numbers from the USDA Crop Progress Report show 76% of the crop as good to excellent. That's two points lower than last week. But growers still need to be on the lookout and scouting for diseases across the state. Southern rust is becoming more prevalent in parts of Nebraska and was recently confirmed in Fillmore County. This disease thrives in higher temperatures and humidity and should be managed on a per case basis. It doesn't necessarily mean we need to spray every field. You may not have it in most fields, but eventually over time you could develop some of it and whether or not it's a threat depends on the stage of the crop, sometimes the hybrid. We do have some resistant hybrids out there. Most of them are more susceptible though. And so if, uh, if you think you need a fungicide application, there's a number of products available to help you manage that. And if you need help identifying it, please reach out to us in Nebraska Extension or submit a sample to the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. Tamara also cautions producers to be mindful of other fungal diseases in their cornfields, such as gray leaf spot. But don't confuse gray leaf spot with bacterial leaf streak. The latter can't be treated with a fungicide application. When it comes to soybeans, 82% of the crop is rated good to excellent, which is a point up from last week. Again, you'll want to make sure you're scouting your fields. Frog eye leaf spot has been confirmed in Nebraska soybean fields again this year, but the way you treat it this time may be different. And that's a concern because we have now confirmed group 11 fungicide resistance in frog eye leaf spot here in Nebraska, much like we have in a lot of our neighboring states. And so, in general, if you think you need to spray for frog eye leaf spot, that's best done between R3 and R5, and that's where a lot of us are at right now. And you're gonna need to be careful about product selection. Just relying on a group 11 fungicide, or what we used to call strobel urine, that's not gonna be effective anymore. So choose products that are a combination of active ingredients representing classes three, seven, or all three, three, seven, and 11, or group one. For more assistance identifying various crop diseases, you can submit your samples to the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. We've got information on how to do that on the Market Journal website. Let's head over for a check on the markets now. Iowa State University Ag Economist Chad Hart joins me to share his analysis of what's happening in fields around the area and any advice as we head into the latter parts of summer. Chad, always great to see you. First off, let's take a minute to get a closer look at crop conditions. Describe for us how things are looking out there. Sure, when you look at those, I mean, I, I think we finally, if you will, are, are starting to see the drought impact showing up in those condition reports. You know, if you look back, the idea is that we've been talking about the drought for a long time, but the crop has been, I would argue, pretty well rated up to this point. We finally started to see that slippage, especially as we're looking at the western side of the Corn Belt. We sort of knew it was coming, it was just a question of when, and now I think the market's trying to wrestle with, okay, this hit us, for the most part, sort of after pollination, so, you know, it, it didn't necessarily, I'll put it this way, damage the genetics of the crop, but it definitely is starting to erode that top end as we're looking at it from the national yield perspective. If you think about last year's crop, it wasn't until we got here to August into September that we really saw those crop conditions slide and we saw that crop shrink up and started, if you will, it gave us the supply side which allowed prices to rally over the past 12 months. And so I think the trade is sitting there again, looking at that going, okay, as we look at the crop right now on the corn side, you've got basically Iowa's sort of the dividing line. You look north and west of us, you know those bushels are getting smaller. We're shrinking that crop up because of the drought conditions out there. On the other side, you look in Illinois to the east of us, the idea is there's been enough rain there to produce a very nice looking crop. 
So are the bushels that are being lost out west being offset by some additional bushels that are being grown out east or not? I think the trade is factoring in that we'll likely see USDA pull back on this yield over time, but it's going to be a slow process, especially as we look here. USDA won't do that objective yield survey like they've done usually in the past in August. They'll start that in September, and I think that's when we'll start to see more movement when it comes to the yield perspective for corn. And let me talk to you about soybeans too, because August, always a big time for soybeans, maybe even bigger this year since the development for uh, much of the crop appears to be ahead of schedule. Kind of the same story with soybeans. What are you watching? Yep, definitely the same story there, but uh, yeah, August weather is even more critical there. When you think about the weather conditions, it's usually July that shapes the corn market and it's August that shapes the soybean market. So uh, as you mentioned here, the idea is it's the same sort of general pattern that we talked about with corn. The difference here being that, hey, these August rains can be really beneficial to the soybean crop. So even where we've been struggling about out west, if we still get some timely rains in here later on in the year, that can help boost that crop perspective for soybeans. And you may have touched on it a little bit, but want to dig in a little deeper regarding demand for corn and soybeans, just uh, kind of what we're seeing and how it's contributing to that bigger marketing picture. Yep, so as we're looking right now, I'd say you know the past couple of weeks, the market has been sort of tepid in terms of what they're seeing in terms of demand, but that's usual this time of year. When you get into late July, into August, this is when demand slows down a bit, waiting for that new crop to come in. But as we look at USDA's projections for the 2021 crop, they do show basically that demand will remain strong, but we'll likely see additional international competition. So as you're looking at feed demand, they expect that to basically hold steady. We're looking for ethanol demand for corn, you know, grind to create fuel to actually go up as we go into the fall. The weak spot here is exports. Just because when you think about what's been happening worldwide here, there's been strong demand for corn and soybeans, but we're also seeing a lot of other countries planting more corn and soybeans because of the price rise over the past 12 months. And so more competition usually means a little bit of a pullback when we're looking in terms of exports. When you add it all together though, you're still talking about a very strong demand platform for both crops going into the harvest season. Uh, can we look into the Chad Hart crystal ball to see maybe what's next on the horizon for exports? Any idea? Yeah, well the biggest thing I'm gonna watch here will be as we get to September, do we start to see those new crop sales really pick up? When you look at corn, what we had was basically, it was very, you know, I would say slow the first three months of here, 2021. But as we got into May, we saw a big ramp up in, in advanced sales that has now tailed off here as we've gotten into July. I'm looking for that to ramp back up again, especially as we look at USDA's targets. While they're saying exports will slow down, they're still talking about 2.5 billion bushels of corn being exported out of the 2021 crop, which would be the second biggest number we've ever had. Same sort of thing as you're looking at the soybean side. They're saying things will pull back, but we're still looking at the second best year we've ever projected for, and that would be well north of, of 2 billion bushels of soybeans. Again, the advanced sales, they actually started out real strong January, February, have slowed down since then, and, and the main market we're gonna watch there is China. They were incredibly active early in the year, but now we're hitting that period of time where seasonally, this is when China usually starts to jump into the soybean market. We should see that activity, like I say, start up within the next three, four weeks. Thanks again to Chad for being with us this week. And let's get a word in on the cattle markets too. In early July, the USDA announced $500 million would be made available this fall to help small meat processors increase market options for farmers and ranchers. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack said the funds will help expand processing capacity and make markets more accessible, fair, and resilient. We spoke with Mike Briggs and asked him his thoughts on the news. I think that's huge. I think the government needed to do something because they allowed so much consolidation of the meatpacking industry to where four players had over 80% of the market. That's never good. 
barriers to entry into that industry are so high because it's so capital intensive and the competition is so hard and so tough that I think they had to do some things to help because we needed to increase capacity. There's, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We do not have a, the ability to process the amount of cattle we need to just to feed people. That's part of the reason the price got so high in the, in the supermarket. I don't ever want to see beef priced out of people's diets. Well, if you can't get it to them, that's what's going to happen, and we have to be able to have that ability. And so we need more packing capacity desperately. Another one of our regular analysts, Elaine Cub, says this initiative is a great opportunity for some beef producers to sell a more value-added product directly to the consumer. The numbers have come out that in the past five years, the, the farmer's share of the beef dollar has gone from 50 some percent down to 30 some percent. And I think that's true. When we see choice beef, box beef selling at 265, and yet the cash cattle market going to the packers is, is kind of stuck at 120 and, and we can never seem to get anything more out of the packers. I think that feels very true to us is we're just not getting as much of the consumer's dollar being passed back to the actual uh, producer of the animal. So what what can we do to fix that? I mean, I think one route, as, as you as you've mentioned here, is to, is to do with more of the direct marketing sales directly through a butcher. Um, that would be certainly probably more cost involved to it, but it's certainly something to try if folks are willing to go that route. And I think there was also some mention in um, the recent executive order from, from the Biden administration about more competitiveness between the few packing companies that we do have in this country. And I don't know, you know, the specifics of how that would work, but again, anything to try to make that, that cash cattle market more competitive and pass back more of the dollars to the actual producer of the animal, I think it, it's worth a shot. Thanks to Mike and Elaine for their thoughts. This is a story we will continue to follow. Next up, any Nebraska farmer can tell you land stewardship is crucial for securing long-term productivity and profitability for the farm. While many producers have successfully implemented several conservation programs around the state, the University of Nebraska's IANR Undersecretary in Residence, Greg Ibaugh, argues expanding on existing programs simply won't be enough to meet both climate and conservation goals in the ag industry. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has more. The USDA Farm Service Agency oversees a wide variety of voluntary conservation-related programs. These programs are designed to address a large number of farming and ranching-related conservation issues, from drinking water protection to wildlife habitat preservation. While these programs have served producers well in the past, University of Nebraska's Greg Ibaugh says it's time to reimagine our federal conservation programs from a practice-driven system to one that is based on outcome. So when I use the term practice-driven, I'm talking about the fact that uh, they have a certain process they want you to do. Maybe it's plant a cover crop of a certain group of species, let it grow so tall, and maybe don't, you're not able to graze it. And they're very prescriptive about what practice you, how you implement that practice. And so that's how they decide whether or not you would qualify for a payment. In some of the discussions that uh, we're having here at UNL, we're talking about what's the outcome that we want to achieve uh, from a conservation practice. And we know just like the old saying goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, that if we want to achieve something on our farms, there's more than one way to do it. So if we want to improve water quality, if we want to improve the nutrient management, if we want to uh, reduce the amount of water we're using on our properties, if we want to uh, curb erosion, there's more than one way to do that. And so what we're looking at at UNL is, is there a way that we could measure how we're achieving those goals or what the outcome is and then create a payment based system for NRCS and USDA based on achieving an outcome which would include practices farmers already use. An outcome based approach would recognize those things that farmers and ranchers are already doing. And as we know, Nebraska farmers and ranchers are some of the most, the first adopters, they're the most progressive when it comes to adopting new technologies or trying new farming methods. We outpace almost any other state in the nation there. So by the time uh, NRCS or 
recognizes that this might be a good practice, Nebraska has already started implementing it. And so by looking at an outcome, we would be able to not only reward and encourage people who aren't engaged in the practice, rotational grazing, to do that, but we might also be able to look back and give farmers and ranchers credit for practices like no-till, cover crops, and rotational grazing that they've already adopted on their farm because it contributes to the outcome that is desired. When it comes to getting the ball rolling on such a progressive change, land-grant universities such as UNL could play a key role in determining a science-based model that could measure conservation costs and benefits for individual operations. So as we look at different practices, we know that as we go look across our nation, there are different soil types, there's different climatic zones. It's a lot easier to establish a cover crop in Missouri than it is to establish one in North Dakota. And so a university, a land grant university across our nation could look at the current conditions, the current soil types, the current to topography of the local uh, farmers and ranchers in, within their service area and design programs and measure the outcomes from different practices uh, locally in, within our state of Nebraska, for example. And so then USDA could look at that score that the, the local university determined to figure out how it matches up with the desired outcome and then base that payment based on something that's local that farmers and ranchers can use that makes sense within their growing area and that uh, has local experts that can help advise them on how to implement that practice as well. With the Biden administration in place, there's been a lot of press, both positive and negative, on the proposed 30 by 30 plan. With an outcome-driven approach to federal conservation programs, this particular proposal may not seem quite as controversial. Well, there's a lot of discussion about the 30 by 30 proposal. Some people are very concerned about it. Some people think it's a, a great idea. What I think is that uh, if we recognized what farmers and ranchers were already doing on their properties and not just expect them to do more, that we would find out that many of the goals of 30 by 30, we might be a long way in reaching that conservation goal of 30%. Uh, under conservation programs by 2030. And so uh, that way we would be able to accomplish an administration goal, but also by recognizing what farmers and ranchers already do, and then create those policy and payment programs within USDA, whether it be carbon banking or uh, water quality incentive programs that uh, are tailored to the, those outcomes that are desired as well and we're rewarding for outcomes, not just activities. And if we recognize what was already in place, it might not be such a scary sounding proposition for Nebraska farmers and ranchers. Either way we look at these programs, it's evident that today's consumers want assurances that agricultural production is performed in the most sustainable way possible. Basing these programs on an outcome-based model rather than one that is practice-driven could help promote scientifically proven practices that can still provide room for growing innovation. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you'd like more information on current conservation programs or you'd like to check out Greg's op-ed on the topic, we've posted a link on the Market Journal website. Next up, the decision to plant a mixture of species or to plant a single species as a cover crop depends on your goals, the time of year for planting, and the costs involved. Mixes can increase biodiversity on a farm and can ensure against weather extremes since different species will thrive in different weather conditions. You can learn more about all of the benefits and potential drawbacks in planting a mixture of species as a cover crop in the July Nebraska Farmer. Next up, farmers have lots of questions this time of year and what to do with their hay is one of them. Baleage and haylage are often used interchangeably, but there are differences, and one may be better for your operation than the other. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh has more. When it comes to harvesting forages, there are two ways producers can do it, either in baleage or haylage. 
Nebraska Extension educator Brad Schick explains what exactly these two options are and how they differ from each other. Right, so they both start out as producing high quality forage. They are usually mowed um, with a swather. A baleage then is baled with a, with a baler. A haylage, however, is then chopped through a silage chopper, a forage chopper, and it's either packed into a bunker, um, a silo, or on the ground, driven over and packed that way. Uh, one of the differences, again, between the baleage and haylage is the particle size. So in a baleage, we have the full stem still, um, just like a dry hay, whereas that uh, haylage, it's chopped, so it's very fine particles, they interweave better, uh, there's less oxygen, which means a, a haylage is going to ensile uh, a little faster, uh, it has more available nutrients or, or mo uh, sugars, moisture content, and it's going to be have, have a little bit lower pH than a baleage would. Brad says there are variables during harvest that can make one option better than the other. So they each other challenges. Um, baleage probably does not store as well as haylage, um, but again, that's a management uh, management dependent, and and making sure you get things packed tight with a haylage will determine that, and also making sure that if there's any holes in your plastic with a baleage, that really determines uh, the quality of it because spoilage uh, rodents may eat through the plastic. Uh, that's something that you really have to keep an eye on. When it comes to equipment. Different machines and attachments are needed to complete each task. However, if a producer is looking to start fresh, there is one method that costs less than the other. So with a baleage, um, you don't have to have a, a feed wagon or anything like that. You can use a hay buster, hay processor, um, or you can roll it out, um, or you can just feed it uh, in, in a bale feeder as well. With a haylage, you're going to have to have some sort of um, feed wagon or something of the sort like you would with any typical uh, corn silage. Brad also says it's not too late to decide which method to use. So uh, this year, you know, if you're doing, if you have an alfalfa or something like that, you probably still have two cuttings left if you're on a four cutting uh, rotation. Um, so there would be an opportunity to still do that. Um, you know, make no mistake about it, it's a management technique. It's going to take some fine tuning, tweaking when you do that, but that would be an easy way to um, add some high quality forage to the operation. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. Brad also says baleage is probably the cheaper option for those that don't have the equipment. In that case, he says you can just buy some plastic and rent a wrapper. Finally, today, let's talk weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, I don't know about you, but I am ready for August, and I'm ready for a favorable forecast. What can you tell us? Well, Troy, if there's anything I can say about this last week, at least we didn't see any snow, but we sure, in all seriousness, did see the heat, and the panhandle got walloped with the 100-degree temperatures, and we've seen that move into the central part of the state as we got into the midweek period. Cold front come through on Thursday, although it was slow to make it into the southern Nebraska, so we endured a little bit more of the heat and the higher heat indice values, but not nearly as bad as we dealt with on the day on Wednesday. Overall, we have seen some expansion of the drought, and we've expected that with some of the dry conditions. And we're going to show you the latest drought monitor map, and this goes through Tuesday morning. So the heat and any of the precipitation that we received since Tuesday morning have not been incorporated into the latest drought monitor map. And what you'll notice is that we are starting to see a return to some of the D3 conditions in the eastern Niobro River Valley and pockets of a moderate drought both in the southwest of the Panhandle and in that area between Fairbury and Hebron. It's very possible that we will see some continual upgrade in the same token with some of the thunderstorm activity that rolled through Minnesota and Wisconsin later late this week. We may be seeing some easing of conditions, especially in those areas that receive several inches of moisture. As we go forward through this week, the biggest issue is the trough that was responsible for our precipitation in the last 24, 36 hours is deepening over the Great Lakes and it's actually shoving that high pressure ridge that was responsible for our heat toward the southwest. So we have a low centered over eastern portions of Minnesota and to the south of us. And here's the remnants of the thunderstorm activity that rolled through the state during the last 12 to 24 hours. 
We notice as we go into tomorrow that that trough basically just broadens out slightly. We're still going to be in eastern Nebraska in a northwest flow, so we're going to see much cooler conditions than we've been experiencing. We're going to be back down into the low to mid 80s across the east. We still may be around the 90 degree mark in the southwest before the cool air moves in. By the time we get to Monday, this trough really starts to dig deep. So we're going to see a pretty extreme temperature difference from west to east. Basically, the east coldest temperatures will be east, and farther west you go, the warmer temperatures, but we're still all going to be below normal for the most part across the state. Now, as we get into Tuesday, it's just signs, at least from the GFS model, that we might start to see this ridge trying to expand a little bit toward the central plains as a trough over the Great Lakes eases up somewhat, but we're still going to have a north to northwesterly flow in the eastern part of the state. Monsoonal moisture pooled up over the central Rockies may generate a few isolated thunderstorms over the panhandle, and then we start to see this ridge pushing just ever so slightly toward the southern plains. That will allow a little bit more of that moisture to move up into the central Rockies, and we might generate an isolated thunderstorms in the high plains region, but I think the real activity comes later in the week. As another big trough starts to move into the Pacific Northwest, it's going to help to flatten out the ridge somewhat and allow some energy to move across the northern periphery of that ridge and also tap the monsoonal flow moisture moving up into the Great Basin. With a low pressure system expected to develop somewhere over southern portions of South Dakota, we may see the generation of thunderstorm activity. And then by Friday, it starts to strengthen this trough once again as it moves it toward the uh, eastern and central Corn Belt. The low pressure sets up over portions of southwestern Iowa. We should see some convergence in, along that uh, area of low pressure. So we are showing some thunderstorm activity that may move through the state. As we go even farther out into the future, the 8 to 14 day forecast keeps us well above normal in regards to temperatures across the northern plains. And that's because we th there is some evidence that we will see that ridge re-expand back in as we get into late next weekend. But in terms of precipitation, with that expansion, we see the drier conditions. Now, depending on which model you run you look at, it looks like this next surge of heat next weekend through the following week will last about somewhere between two to five days, depending on model. Then we see another trough coming in, and it's that trough that looks like it may generate some more decent moisture returns. So it's outside this eight to 14 day window, but let's hope that that is right. Otherwise, we're gonna to start to see some serious declines in the crop conditions across the state. So overall, some cooler conditions for this next week. Not much in the way of major precipitation events though. Thanks, Al. Always appreciate that forecast. That is going to do it for this week's show. Be sure to check us out on all our socials and the Market Journal website. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.